Welcome everybody. Um, we're presenting three panel sessions here today, um, this being the first of three obviously. The first one today we're going to be focusing on what happens before the race, what happens in the preparation to a big cycling race. So um, we might get started straight away, we've only got about 20-25 minutes until the peloton come through for their first pass up here at Arthur's Seat. Uh, Dave, let's go to you first. Um, there's a bit of a perception that sports psychology is all about whispering a couple of magic words in the ears of elite athletes and somehow making them perform a little bit better. How close is that to reality and what's involved in your role as a sports psychologist? Uh, yeah, good question, Matt. Uh, it's about as close, uh, close to reality as we are to Melbourne. It's a long, long way. Uh, if we could do that, if we could whisper magical things in the ears of the best riders, then I'd be retired on a yacht somewhere out in the Bahamas. Really... Uh, What's, what we do is we actually work with the athlete to try and understand uh, their world and the things that may be holding them back from uh, riding at the usual capacity that they ride at, if we're talking about uh, cycling as we are today. Uh, and it's not a case of whispering anything magical at all, but rather a case of listening very intently and trying to understand uh, as best as possible to try and find uh, some solutions together that they can put into place, very practical uh, strategies to help them in their training, uh, which is actually what makes them ride fast. It's the training that makes them ride fast and not the words that come from the mouth of the sports psychologist, although sometimes you get lucky and the psych may feel like you said, uh, the cyclist may feel like you said something that uh, just helped them uh, find their way through that particular tough spot. And I bet you're happy to take credit for that as well. Absolutely, never, never shy away from it. <laughs> Phil, let's go to you. Uh, in the late 70s, you packed up and moved to Europe to try your hand at uh, professional cycling over there. Did sports psychology as a discipline exist back then or who did you go to with concerns about how you were feeling or how you were adjusting to life over in Europe? Uh, no, we didn't have much uh, support in that regard uh, back then. I mean, now there's, uh, there's Institute of Sports, there's Academy of Sports uh, with a full range of facilities to assist the uh, young athlete in that way. Unfortunately, we didn't have that back then. I was just uh, a member of a club in Melbourne and... Uh, yeah, we just didn't have that kind of support. I think, uh, you know, there are very few riders riding at the elite level in, in Europe when, when I got over there. There's quite a few riders giving it a go in, in the Kermes scene, in the circuit races in, in uh, Belgium, and uh, a, a few scattered around uh, France and Italy. But, uh, yeah, already at that, at that uh, to make it to that level, they had to be mentally and physically pretty tough just to uh, leave, leave Australia. So, Dave, what is it that, that sets, say, a sports psychologist apart from, um, say, a, a partner or a friend or, or whatever it is of a cyclist or any athlete that goes over and, and tries something new? What, what can you bring that, that someone just listening to, to somebody about what they're going through can't bring? Uh, yeah, well, I guess the thing that differentiates us from, uh, from a loving partner or coach or friend or whatever the case may be is uh, the relationship is one based on uh, confidentiality and, and, not, and being non-judgmental. And sometimes when we're talking to a partner or a close friend, there may be things that we really uh, don't want to say uh, or don't feel comfortable in saying because it can change the dynamics uh, between us. Not all the time, but sometimes. Uh, and really, it's our job to bring our, our skill set of not only hearing the things that they do say, but for listening to the things that they don't say uh, and trying to connect that together uh, with the picture that they're giving us of their world to link that with things that may be, uh, may be hurting them but also things that are helping them for when they're going good. It's not always about going bad. So I guess we're in a really privileged position, a special uh, relationship to hear the most intimate stories, fears uh, and stuff from athletes uh, that aren't always easy to express uh, to our friends because sometimes it can be seen as a sign of weakness. Again, not always, but these are the common things that we tend to see. Let's talk a little bit about how you'd go about preparing yourself psychologically for an event such as the Jaco Herald Sun Tour or the, the Tour de France. Um, Gary, part of your job is to work with cyclists on their bike setup as a, as a sports physiotherapist to ensure comfort, efficiency and, and proper technique. How important is that sort of preparation in, in preparing somebody psychologically as well as physically for an event such as this? Well, by the time that most of these cyclists get to the, uh, the start line, their setup is uh, pretty well in, entrenched. However, uh, little niggles happen to everybody, and these guys aren't just preparing for this race. They're preparing for several stages. They're preparing for several races throughout the year. So very rarely does anyone get to the, the, uh, the, the start line in absolutely fantastic conditions. So um, 
the role of the physio is actually about making sure that that cyclist at that time can actually sit on the bike and behave as the human machine for those 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 pedals, um, and so that it's not so much just about bike setup. It's actually about the person and maximising uh, their ability to work as a, as a machine. So. Um, physios work uh, in, in terms of uh, exercise, strength, flexibility, um, control, uh, and work with sports science people to make sure that uh, that person has recovered well, uh, so that they can do the job. So setup is more is more than just the bike; it's also about the person. How, how much um, refinement, Gary, would you be doing um, with with a cyclist during an event like this, or, or in a longer event such as um, the Tour de France over three weeks? How much adjustment to position and setup would you be doing, or is there other things you'd be more focused on doing? Well, in in uh, you know, as we were saying, that uh, each rider gets to the uh, to, to the start line of each stage or each each event carrying a little bit of a, a, a niggle, and an assessment of th those injuries might mean that that, for instance. They would be developing pain most commonly in the back um, and, uh, and let's say if someone's carrying a bit of a back injury uh, and they're in a, a situation where they've got to be in a very cramped position, uh, pour, pouring on a lot of power for a prolonged period, then that pain might be something that interferes with their performance. So you'd assess the, the rider on that, that day well knowing what their past history is and perhaps modify the setup a little bit so they will be more comfortable for a longer period. And it might mean that we actually have to go in with a bit of a different race plan, that this, this rider will actually have to get out of the saddle every so long, uh, every so often rather, and have a bit of a stretch just to make sure that during those crucial passes um, and in those crucial efforts, that pain isn't playing on their mind. They've, uh, you know, they've all learned to suffer, uh, and, and that's what these guys know how to do. But what they don't want to be suffering is pain from another source other than their muscles. A big part of psychological preparation for a big race, I assume, also comes in overcoming nerves, anxiety and the unknowns. And Phil, I want to throw back to you here. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like approaching your first Tour de France back in 1981, if I'm not mistaken. What was the biggest psychological challenge for you coming into that race? I think possibly uh, making sure I didn't let the team down. Uh... I was on a French team and I was the only non-French uh, rider on the team and, and uh, you know, my job was there as a, as a domestic, uh, you know, making sure that my uh, teammates got uh, plenty of uh, drink and, and uh, you know, that if they need to go to the bathroom that they were pushed while, they were, while we were going along. Uh, I didn't let them down in that department. All the good jobs then. All the good jobs, yeah, that's where the uh, domestic name comes from. But uh, also... Uh, making sure that our team leaders were uh, kept out of the wind and, and arrived at the crucial spots uh, as fresh as possible. So, I mean, quite a bit of working on the front, but uh, that was a bit of an historic time because, of course, my first Tour de France, I got the yellow jersey, so thing cha things sort of changed uh, my role on the team by about day five. But, uh, yeah, it was a bit, daunt bit daunting going into the event. Uh, you know, it's a different... Different period of time now, of course, we can flick on the television and see uh, live coverage every day and... You know, there's, uh, you know, numerous websites, you can get live feed, you know, so we're quite educated. Everybody knows what's going on in the Tour de France. Uh, back then, you know, I was desperate for information to find out what it was all about. This is before I went over there. So it's completely different. Now I think a rider got heading over to Europe, it's possibly more, they'd be more fearful because they know what, what to expect. When I first went over there, I had no idea what I was embarking upon, um, you know, but I, I, I did reasonably well when I was over there. Maybe it was because I, I, I was naive and had no idea what I was uh, getting into. What was it like the second time round? Obviously, you, you've, you've finished the tour the first time that you've attempted, you've done, as you said, very well. What's it like then coming back for the second time, knowing a little bit about what the, the event entails? <laughs> the Red Ride boys looking very fresh. OK, round two. <laughs> what was it like the second time around the Tour de France, having done it once already? Yeah, I mean, it's like doing anything for the second time. Uh, having done it reasonably well the first time, I was a lot more confident, Had uh, didn't have any fear of, you know, you don't have to concern yourself about finishing the event. It's more about, you know, how you can uh, place in the event. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd finished in the top ten the first tour, and so it was... It was uh, 
being able to do the same, if not better. Um, I got in the yellow jersey on day two, and so <laughs> I was already, um, you know, had achieved my goal early on, and it was just a matter of defending that, and, and uh, I ended up getting the young riders uh, jersey that year, and, uh, you know, established myself as, as a, um, you know, as, as a potential winner of the tour uh, down the track as a, as, a, as a more mature rider. But, uh, you know, I think coming into the tour that, that year, after doing what I did in the first year, I had no fears. I didn't have any um, qualms about, you know, the event itself. But I just, again, I just didn't want to let my team down. And, and you know, if you have the yellow jersey, it puts a lot of pressure on you. And, and you know, I still wanted to, you know, fare in the third week. Um, you know, as well as I did in the first, and, and I achieved that, and, um, you know, I was happy, but, you know, my career was obviously taking a, uh, a fresh direction. Dave, say you're, you're on Phil's team, uh, as part of his team at his first Tour de France. What do you, what do you say to Phil? Do, do you go and approach him? He look, you know, it looks like maybe he's, um, he's struggling a little bit first year in, in the Tour de France. Do you approach him, or do you wait for him to come to you? What's, what's your position there? Uh, to, to be honest, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't approach the athletes and, uh, and profess to be able to see something uh, that's going on for them, depending on the nature of uh, your relationship. Uh, some athletes will invite you to do that. Uh, some riders I've worked with have said, come and, come and talk to me if you see anything uh, at all that looks untoward. And, but very rarely would I ever go, uh, if, if at all, uh, ever go up and say, oh, you know, Phil, yeah, you look nervous, particularly if I was lucky enough to be in that situation. It's kind of like uh, being asked to tune up a Ferrari. You just go and rub the bonnet with a little bit of uh, a cloth and say, OK, I'll leave it alone. Uh, I, re I would actually, in answer to that, I would, I would wait for the athlete to come and see me because uh, oftentimes it's, it's worth thinking about what happens in the athlete's mind if you start... Uh, walking over there, do they start thinking, oh, oh, is there something wrong with me at a time where they really don't need to be thinking about that? Uh, so it's really worth taking into consideration the relationship that you have with the athlete. And oftentimes it'll be more the coach that probably goes over and says something, depending on what t uh, team setup they have. Uh, but yeah, generally a case of waiting for the athlete to speak to you. Gary, I might just throw to you quickly there. I want to talk a little bit about superstitions and preparations and rituals and all that kind of thing. A lot of sports people have these little things that they do. It might be putting on one sock first or it might be, you know, a little dance they do beforehand or whatever it might be. What sort of role do you reckon this plays in, in sort of preparing somebody for an erase, a race or an event? Uh, that's a good question. I think I'll have to think about that for a little while myself and uh, rub my, my uh, lucky socks. But, <laughs> yeah, I see plenty of uh, cyclists who, who have uh, their lucky pair of socks, their lucky pair of nicks. Um, and but each athlete, and it doesn't matter whether or not it's cycling or or football, they do have a a pre uh, race or a pre event um, routine that they go through. A lot of people go through, as far as I'm concerned, they they will go through uh, not only a ride through of the course, for instance, but they'll do their own um, their own their own stretching. Everything wants to basically confirm to them that they are doing everything right as it happened on the best ride I ever had. And so I think they are important little rituals. Um, they also want to know from their body that they are going to be able to get the most out of it on that day. That's actually most important for, for them. So a lot of them will actually do a, um, a, a routine of, of, of stretching. They might go through uh, a little bit of a ride, sit on the rollers, make sure that, that uh, those legs are able to spin and spin comfortably so that they can get to that, uh, that line with as much confidence and um, get on a roll. We've only got a couple of minutes left here, but I think I might throw back to Phil. Um, a little bit, talk a little bit about pressure and expectations here. And obviously, um, Cadell Evans going into this year's Tour de France is one of the favourites, if not the favourite. And of course, he you know, came away with the victory in, in fantastic style that none of us will ever forget, I suppose. But how do you withstand that sort of expectation and the pressure going into a big event like that, Phil? Do you, do you feel it as a cyclist, that sort of pressure? Uh, yeah, no, you do. I mean, a, a rider puts pressure on himself. I think a top rider should put pressure on himself. Uh, you know, I don't think it should be the people around him. I think there's an expect, you know, whenever there's an expectation, if you're a, a team leader or a, uh, you know, potential winner of an event, uh, it's up to yourself to put, put pressure on yourself. I don't think you need to be coached uh, in that. Um, you know, it's a bit, bit different with uh, young kids or something like that where you're just trying to keep them motivated all the time. I think, 
you know, Cadell, he's, he's, you know, been a uh, favourite for a few years now in the Tour de France and, uh, you know, he doesn't need to be reminded. It's not like, you know, you see the kids down at Oz kick, uh, Oz kick, you know, with the parents sitting on the fence going, you know, go Johnny, do, you know, <laughs> get up. Uh, the kid, you know, Cadell knew, knew what to do. And Lisa Jacobs going to come down and take it out. What a ride by Lisa Jacobs. Across the line she goes. Salute Lisa shows she's the queen of the mountain.